I'd like to introduce Sue Charman, who's um, a, an expert on social software and does lots of consulting with large companies, helping them implement it and bringing blogs and wikis and the kind of tools that we take for granted into ordinary companies. Um, and she's going to tell us the problems that people have there and Thanks. lots of other interesting things, I'm sure. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. Um, OK, so I've been a social software consultant for about three years. I started off calling myself a blog consultant. And, and when I said that I was going to do this for a living, people kind of laughed and went, how can any, how, no one is get, really needs to be told how to blog. You know, you, this isn't going to work. But it turns out that um, it's a bit trickier than it seems when you're using blogs in business. Um, so I'm going to talk primarily about using blogs internally, because uh, blogs and wikis internally. I think the, the external stuff, the marketing stuff, has been uh, fairly well covered. But um, what I focus on is helping companies understand uh, how they can use blogs and wikis and what happens, what you can do when things go a bit wrong. Um, what I tend to find is that companies will install the software because it's very easy to install. Um, a few people will start using it, but then they won't actually be able to get the wider uh, sort of community in, internally to, to use the software. So much of what I'm saying is from experience of working with clients and, and, and the problems that we've actually seen and the way that we've um, dealt with them. Um, so just out of curiosity, how many of you are already using blogs and wikis internally? Okay. How many of you would if you thought they were any use? Right. Because um, I think the, the main difference between um, blogs and, and, and wikis and the way that they're used internally rather than externally is you know, basically wikis for collaboration, um, blogs for publishing. And it's fairly kind of clear if you're into this whole sort of tech stuff how, how the technology works, um, but it's not always clear why some people don't adopt social software. So even if you have people who understand wikis, I and mean, even if they're active on something like Wikipedia, they don't necessarily like using this software internally for, for work. And there's, um, there's a whole number of reasons uh, why this is that we've come across. Um, firstly, is this kind of slightly odd, very low level fear of social humiliation that people get really quite concerned sometimes about how they're going to come across to their peers and, and particularly their bosses. They're scared of saying the wrong thing, of making a mistake and, and looking like an idiot. And quite often, this is kind of a very low level um, fear that they don't even realize themselves. They just feel kind of uncomfortable with the idea of talking publicly to their colleagues. Um, people feel quite comfortable with email, because email is essentially a one-to-one -one communication or uh, uh, sort of many-to-many, -many, but it feels private. So even though your emails are going to be stored on servers, even though they can be forwarded and printed out and all the rest of it, it feels like a private medium, like you're not exposing yourself. So people will send emails, they're happy to CC others in and BCC and, and all of this stuff. But when you're actually giving people what is a very demonstrably public place to work, then this kind of shyness sets in. Um, there's also a lot of people who actually aren't very comfortable with the idea of writing. Um, it seems kind of like slightly weird to say that in a highly literate society, but people have different comfort levels with the way that they express themselves. Some people are much better talking to others and, and, and actually having conversations. Um, other people feel very comfortable writing rather than um, using the phone. But there, are, there is always a subset of people who just feel uncomfortable using the written word in a kind of what seems to them like a semi-formal environment. And again, you see with email, you get a lot of very informal uh, writing. So no one really minds if your spelling's rubbish. No one really minds if your grammar is a bit off. Um, if you're very writing very brief emails, very to the point emails, that's kind of all acceptable within the email culture. But the perception of blogs and wikis is that it's much more formal, that it requires a much higher level of um, skill with, with writing. And again, this is something that people will never admit. They'll never kind of actually say, oh, I feel really uncomfortable writing in public. 
but there's, there's a lot of this that's kind of just bubbling underneath the surface. Um, other issues is that, uh, Particularly, it, this varies from organization to organization. If you have a very open organization where you can kind of do whatever you like, um, then this doesn't, I think, isn't so much of an issue. But within hierarchical organizations, unless permission is explicitly given to use specific tools, um, that can really get in the way. People feel like, well, maybe I'm not supposed to be doing this. And if my boss sees, maybe this will be a problem. And I really don't want to have that confrontation. So unless there's explicit permission to use social tools, then, then because I think they have the word social in and, and blogs are seen very much as like, well, they're diaries and they're kind of personal. So it, there's a sort of psychological mismatch between what people think the blogs and, and wiki should be used for and what they're actually used for, for in business. Um, there's also a, a level of trust within the tool. Do you trust the tool to do what you want it to? Um, we see this particularly with wikis of people. Um, when I've been, uh, been in, in, in organizations showing people wikis for the first time, and you go through that enlightenment process of this is a wiki, it's a web page that everyone can edit. And the first thing they say is, so you mean other people can change my stuff? Yes, other people can change your stuff. Can I stop them? And there's this sort of idea of, of, of kind of not feeling quite comfortable that they can trust the content that's put on a wiki or the content that's on a blog, and that they don't necessarily trust the tools either. Because, well, what if it loses everything? Um, and I think you know, this is something I doubt very much whether you have that issue here because of the, the culture that you have here. But I see it a lot in, in other organizations. Um, and finally, uh, well, not finally, trusting the tool to still be there in a year or two years' time. I mean, this has been a big issue. I worked with one investment bank, and they already had um, a small wiki that was being used by IT, and they installed a, a company-wide wiki. And a lot of people are like, well, you know, if we put all of our data in this, is it still going to be here in a year's time? Are there any guarantees from management that this is a secure place for us to put stuff. It's not just going to, I'm going to wake up one day, get into work, and everything that I've written is going to be gone. Um, but the biggest barrier for many people is actually they just don't see the point. They kind of look at, at social software, and they see it as an overhead, something they have to do in addition to all of the work that they're already doing. So they look at it. It's, it's a bit like um, knowledge management software that was uh, promoted as, as being the wonderful way to gather your company's knowledge and, and manage it. And no one really ever figured out what the hell that meant. You manage knowledge. Um, but what happened was lots of companies spent lots of money on these big, huge systems and then said to their staff, right, we want you to put all of your documents in this. And their staff just kind of went, why? They couldn't see any benefit to them. There was a definite, you could see the benefit to the business if all the documents and everything's all in. Um, some big workflow and categorize and that. But the overhead for the individuals was just way too high. They didn't get any personal benefit out of this at all. And the biggest challenge um, that I have when I'm explaining this stuff to people is how it can help them and, and why it's actually useful. So let's say that you've, got, you've decided that you're going to use, um, say, a wiki for product documentation or product specs or for logging, constantly changing information. Or you're going to use a blog to publish stuff that maybe you've been sending out by email on a regular basis, or to communicate with your team, or to keep your own notes, or, or whatever. And you actually want to start getting other people involved in, in what you're doing and, and using this software at the same time. There are kind of two basic routes for doing this. It's kind of like top down and bottom up. And um, the traditional way of getting people to use software is to go, here's the software, you will now use it. This sort of top-down command and control approach. Um, that kind of works all right. Firstly, if you have that kind of hierarchical organization where you have managers who have control over what you do. Um, and secondly, it works if the managers persist in forever saying, you must do this, otherwise you're in trouble. As soon as managers stop 
saying, you must use this, otherwise you're in trouble. People will just kind of like, if they're not convinced it's useful, they'll just stop using it. it it's amazing how uh, quickly people will abandon software that they don't find useful. The bottom-up approach is kind of like your grassroots, sort of um, organic approach where people will just start using stuff because they think that it's, it's interesting, it's useful, it helps them. Um, so I've seen in a number of companies this kind of like Trojan mouse projects where somebody somewhere has got a little server that they can just like shove a blog on, shove a wiki on. They really tell IT. Um, they just kind of get on with it, and it kind of spreads through the organization. And eventually, someone kind of goes, oh, hang on a minute. Didn't realize we had blogs. Didn't realize we had a wiki. Where did that come from? And that kind of grassroots um, effect can be very powerful in, in getting people to use this kind of software, because the only people that are using it are people who see that it's, it's useful. But it does risk, firstly, having multiple centers, multiple installations. So maybe someone's you know, using MediaWiki and maybe someone else is using TiddlyWiki or whatever. And you end up with these silos, where you've got one group using one wiki and one group using another. And they really need to be talking to each other. But they're stuck in different software. Um, the other issue with this is that sometimes when management finds out that you've been quietly using a wiki or a blog somewhere without telling them that they come along and say, we're not having that, we're shutting it down. So ultimately, what you really need is kind of like a, a sort of middle way. So you have the support from above that says, yes, you can use this, this is good software, we encourage you to um, get involved in this. But you also have buy-in and, and support from below, that the people who are actually using the software find it useful and... and um, decide that this is something they will help each other to, to use. Um, when you're looking at um, sort of the bottom-up uh, way of fostering adoption, um, there's a, I wrote a, an adoption strategy a while back based on some of the work that I've been um, doing. And I just want to kind of like run through it, because if, if you're in a situation where you want to use wikis and you have colleagues who aren't really so, so sure about it, this is a kind of like good set of steps to go through to get them involved in what you're doing. So the first thing that you need to do is figure out what, who your users are. So it's very easy to kind of think about users in, en masse and, and kind of say, well, they're people who are working on such and such a project. But within that, you have small, discrete user groups of people who have shared needs and shared actions. So this is all about what people are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, if you have project managers that are kind of working on different bits of the same project, or if you have... You know, in, in a lot of organizations, actually, secretaries and PAs are really good people to, to focus on because they all do roughly the same thing in roughly the same way. And you can get them talking to each other, get them kind of adopting the software, and then they kind of spread it out. But you have to understand what they actually do every day. Um, a good place to start with this is look at how people are using email. Email is one of the most abused bits of software that we have in business. Um, we suffer from occupational spam, you know, stuff that you'll CC'd on that comes from somebody in the business. It's kind of official, but it bears no real relevance to your day-to-day -day action. Um, people just letting you know stuff, just CCing you because they think you ought to know what's going on. Um, stuff from departments that have accidentally sent it to you know, the wrong mailing list. We get huge amounts of email that kind of don't really need, but we also use email very badly for things like conversation. So the CC list, um, it's very easy for you to get started on a conversation with your colleagues. Um, then someone gets missed off the CC list, and then the, or someone just replies to you and not to the whole group. And the conversation starts to fragment across different inboxes. And you can't access other people's inboxes and just start reading their mail. So you don't necessarily, you're not aware of all the little sub conversations that are happening um, once that's, that's, that fragmentation's occurred. Um, the other thing is, is that people, particularly when writing documents, so um, you know, product specs, meeting agendas, this sort of thing, 
they will send out attachments to half a dozen people, get half a dozen sets of responses back, and then you have to sit and hand merge. So these are kind of specific behaviors that you can look at that people are using email for, where you can say, actually, you know, there are better places to do this. There are better ways that we can do this that are you know, easier, less overhead, and um, you know, much quicker. Um, so once you've kind of like identified the user groups, identified um, what they do, identified who, who's influential within your area, because we have the, the organization chart. Um, I don't even know, does Google have an org chart? Probably somewhere. But you ha always have an informal organization within any business of the people who know each other and the people who, maybe they're not even working together, but you know, they talk a lot, they exchange ideas. So identifying people who are these kind of like little super nodes, who kind of bridge different communities, different parts of the company, and who can actually help you to um, you know, spread adoption of, of any particular tool is quite important. These are people that can really push a tool from being um, something that's used locally to something that's used um, business-wide. Um, and then sort of think about what is it that you're actually doing for them? How is this going to make part of their lives easier? So um, we identify, I worked um, with uh, an investment bank in, in, in London called Dresner Klein or Wasserstein. And one of the things that we did was um, looked at how people were uh, using email, what they were doing, and then figured out how they could do it better on, the, on in this case, the wiki. Um, and some of the use cases were really, really small, simple use cases. It was nothing particularly impressive. It was things like uh, doing presentations collaboratively. Um, so one of the managers needed to suddenly was told, you have to give a presentation in four hours on your project, had to come up with his PowerPoint slides. Um, I mean, I personally don't believe in PowerPoint, as you can tell. Um, but they, were used, they basically had to come up with this whole presentation and they did it on the wiki. They broke it down into sections. Um, they kind of brainstormed it on the wiki. And then once they had enough uh, ideas, they kind of separated it out, gave each person responsibility for a given chunk of the presentation. They worked on it simultaneously, brought it back together in the wiki, and then final edit. And at that point, it was put into PowerPoint for the presentation. Doing that by email just would never have worked, not in a four hour time period. It just would have been really painful. Um, the other thing that was really, really caught, caught on, and again, it's incredibly mundane, some of this stuff, was meeting agendas and meeting notes. So instead of sending an agenda around, people were sending agendas around in PowerPoint, in Excel, in Word, um, you know, all sorts of different ways. And, and sending these uh, multiple attachments out, getting multiple ones in, then having to hand merge it all, and then someone somewhere would have their bit missed off and would be kind of like, well, you know, you know my, my thing wasn't on the agenda. And then the meeting minutes, again, would be sent round in a Word document or something. Uh, changes would be sent back individually. And it's these kind of patterns. They're sort of like looking for where conversations and where behaviors are fragmented and then bringing them together in something like a wiki. Um, with blogs, a lot of this stuff is kind of um, anybody that's publishing something on a regular basis, newsletters once a week or whatever. And they, they were very small, tiny little use cases. But when you sat down with people and said, you know, this is how you can change what you're doing now and make it easier, they would then take that, get get their heads around that, adopt it, and then they start to generalize out to other areas of, of their work. Because one of the things that I learned was that people are actually quite bad at generalizing from a very high level view. So when you say, uh, wikis are about collaboration, blogs are about publishing, it's all about conversation, you can work with your colleagues and discuss things, and they kind of go, well, why would I want to do that? When you say, you can take the pain out of doing meeting minutes, they kind of go, oh, okay, that makes more sense. So it's being quite specific. Um, the other thing that we found was that you really don't need to do huge amounts of training or anything on these tools. Most people pick them up really quickly. It really is about giving them context and understanding about how this helps them. Um, and we got a bit old school with some of the, the stuff that we did. 
Um, we obviously had pages on the wiki and that saying, this is how you use this tool. Um, but if they weren't comfortable with the wiki anyway, it's kind of not the right place to put um, the material to make them comfortable with the wiki. So we just printed out um, sheets of paper, little trifold sheets that said, this is how you do it, this is um, how it works, how you do bold and all the rest of it. And that was really effective because it was something that you know, was very easy for them. They didn't have to go and find uh, the page. Um, ironically, I found, you know, I think one of the big strengths of wikis is that they're a flat architecture. They don't have a hierarchy. But again, people are so used to hierarchies within websites. It's kind of like you know, ingrained in everyone now that you start at the home page, then you click a link, and then you see some more links, and you click that one. And we found actually people within the wiki, instead of leaving it flat and using search, they created their own hierarchies regardless of what you did. So we had the front page, it had a list of departments, within the departments it had a list of teams, within the teams a list of projects, within the projects a list of pages. And so you end up with this kind of like, you know, five click hierarchy of, of, of navigation that they've created because that's what they feel comfortable with. So again, it was kind of like, you know, if this is the behavior that they feel comfortable with, then we'll enable this. And we came up with, um, naming schemes for each page so that people understood, you know, if you've got a half a dozen um, projects and, and they all want the page FAC, then you can only have one page on a wiki that's called FAC. So it was like, okay, we'll have the um, team name, project name, page name um, in the title so that it differentiates. You could immediately see all of the pages, how they were grouped together, and it gave people the kind of structure that they're used to. It made them feel more comfortable with the tool. Um, the other thing that we did as well was actually uh, be very open to letting people use these tools how they want to. So um, there's quite a lot of kind of social stuff that went on. People would be introduced to the wiki or the blogs via, say, um, the coffee rotor page where it was like, well, who wants co what coffee this morning? And you know, whoever's turn it was to go and get the coffee. Um, sports pages, this sort of thing. So that people had a fairly gentle in, uh, route in to, to using these tools. Um, and then what we also found was that as we were introducing this to more and more people and sitting down with them and figuring out what they need and giving them that kind of really personalized help, we started to see a real drop off. Basically, kind of support requests kind of went rose and rose and rose as adoption rose, and then just kind of went fluff, fell off a cliff. And, and suddenly, literally over a period of about two weeks, no more support requests at all. And it was like, well, you know, this is quite interesting. What was happening was that there were enough people within the business who were using the tools and understood well, this is useful for this, and this is useful for that, and this is how you do all this stuff, that they were actually acting as little sort of localized trainers themselves. So there was no need for them to actually um, ask us for help because they were doing it within their own groups. And at that point, it's kind of like, right, well, we've reached critical mass, and, and at that point, I basically got fired. Um, job done, essentially. Um, do, do, do. So in terms of kind of like top-down stuff, I'm much more in favor of the kind of bottom-up approach, but sometimes you need to kind of marry it with the, the top-down stuff as well. The um, important thing was having managers that accepted the tools. And within a really big organization, um, I mean, DRKW was 6,000 staff spread sort of in half a dozen time zones. And it was quite a hierarchical business. And so if you had one middle manager that basically went, no, I'm sorry, this is a waste of time. None of my staff are using this. It kind of like blacked out a whole pyramid of the company. And we did have this. We did have people actually saying, you know, there's over my dead body. Is anyone going to be in my team going to be caught using Wiki? And this was a bit of a problem because all these things are political. You know, it, as a consultant, it's very difficult for me to actually look at this sort of politics of a company. And I, I can look at them and I kind of go, you're trouble, you're going to be really good, you're going to be a pain in the ass. I can figure out from externally, it's, it's 
it's kind of like laid bare if you're an external consultant. Internally, of course, it's a different kettle of fish. You're so caught up in you know, what's going on and, and who knows who and, and who's difficult and who you've got to keep happy that um, these people that can be blocks can really get in the way of one of these sorts of projects. Um, the way I kind of deal with it was, you know, wherever you can, just route around them. But you can't convert everybody. Some people are always going to turn around and go, you know, social software. We don't have social in our business. Um, so when you do get kind of the managers that have the foresight to, to have the like, buy-in for this and kind of say, yes, fine, we'll, we'll encourage our, our, our teams to use this. Um, the ones that were most successful were the ones that were very active. So active themselves using the tool. So they were blogging, they were using the wiki, so it's kind of leading by example. Active in encouraging their staff to use these tools. So um, there was one guy who every time someone asked him a question, replied with a one-liner that just said, see this, link to the wiki. He refused to enter into any discussion other than on his blog or on his wiki. It was like he was stepping away from email and going, just not interested. And that had a massive, massive effect because suddenly, you know, people who wanted information out of him, whereas previously he would have gone, okay, you want this document, here it is, here's an attachment. Um, he'd put all of his documents up on the wiki and it was like, it's there. You don't need to ask me for this anymore. You can just go and download it. So if you keep losing your documentation, then it's always there for you. Um, also, um, it's very easy. I mean, so when I first started, I started blogging as a personal blogger five years ago. Um, my blog is called Chocolate and Vodka, if anyone's interested. And I kind of, the first sort of three or four months were really gappy. So I would blog furiously for three or four weeks and then kind of like go, oh, I'm busy. And then nothing for a month. And then I'd kind of go, oh, no, I haven't gone away, I haven't died. And I'd blog again, and then there'd be another gap. And exactly the same thing happens in business, that people um, will start doing something, and then they'll give up for a bit. And then you can encourage them and keep, keep going. And it's this whole kind of like, you know, never give up restarting doing what you're doing. It's very difficult to change habits. And it's, it's, it's very easy to kind of slip back into the old way of doing stuff. And that actually doesn't matter. If that happens, fine. Just keep encouraging people to, to um, oops, uh, keep going. Um, but at the end of the day, one of the most important things to remember, and this was something, that, again, with the management, had, with some people had difficulty understanding, is that adoption and usage is not the goal. It, it's no point. I mean, you can say, you know, we've got X number of staff and 70% and, you know, of them are reading the wiki and 30% you know, of them are using it, and, and that's nice. But adoption isn't the goal. Getting your job done is the goal. Preferably getting your job done easier and, and, and quicker and um, you know, less painfully. So um, I think that, that's sort of an important one to remember because when you get really focused on the wrong thing, and the, the wrong goal, then it kind of diverts you from what you're actually trying to achieve, which is an easier life, as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, a job that you enjoy and doing it as best as you can, as efficiently as you can. Um, okay. So uh, that was basically kind of what I wanted to um, talk about. You know, that I hope some of that was useful. I'm quite happy to answer questions if anyone's got any. Or to equally, if all of this is stuff you already know, <laughs> I'd like to know that too. Um, isn't it a bad business model for a consultant to empower the users? So <laughs> <laughs> we see, I did this, I wrote this um, uh, social software adoption strategy. It's on my blog, and it's, it basically outlines most of this stuff. And um, I was at a conference last week, and I had a, several people come up to me. That post is fabulous. We've been doing this in our business, and now everyone's using the wiki. And I did think to myself, you know what? I'm really doing myself out of a job here. But there are just more companies out there that you know, they will read this and go, uh, this, it makes sense, but we really don't know how to actually do it. So um, I think you know, the, the, as far as I, the way that I look at it is I like to go in, help people leave, and let them sort themselves out.
I don't want to perpetuate the... I hate the word consultant because it has all these connotations of people who perpetuate their own employment by creating problems. Um, whereas I like to shorten my employment by making people happy. It just means I get to do more different things. Um, one thing I didn't really hear you talk about is the question of like the broader social net of the whole world versus like within the company a kind of firewall around the wiki. So like you know, there I would imagine in financial type services you've got a lot of secrecy and a lot of stuff like that. So they'll say this is a wall and only people inside. But like, can can companies or do you work with organizations that actually find these kinds of tools? for interacting with partners, interacting with the public, and so on and so forth yeah. as well. So there's kind of like different um, models. You have um, your internal, uh, within the firewall, uh, social software. And so in the financial services, you have uh, these Chinese walls, these regulatory walls that say, you know, you can, these people cannot talk to these people until this event horizon has passed. Um, and with wikis, it's actually quite easy to um, create uh, little walled gardens that only certain people have access to. You can actually kind of seal things off. Um, you can also create areas that cross, that bridge the firewall, so that you have access from your people internally and access from your clients, and you can control um, who gets that access. And one of the things that I found um, quite interesting was that the regulatory uh, side of things, the compliance officers love wikis in particular because there's a, a, a pure edit history. Every edit is, that's made is um, logged and who made it and when. So they actually prefer wikis than something like email. If you have to do compliance on some email conversation, it's a nightmare. You do it in a wiki, it's pretty easy. Um, blogs are kind of like slightly halfway house because you can go back and edit blog entries, but there's no, not necessarily any record of that. But blogs tend to be a lot more static, that once you've published them, they kind of stay published. Um, but certainly for, for compliance, they loved the wikis. They thought it was great. So. I, just, I have a question about the Without going into too much detail, and maybe you covered this, they said that it was difficult to find materials, and some of that's because of a more collegial and informal way of posting in the wiki, and yet there's a, a need for sort of a canonical reference for a particular engineering you know, procedure. Do, how do you deal with that kind of thing? People saying, this is either updated, or it's confusing, or I have to actually email someone to ask them. So the organization of information within the wiki is, is interesting. I've seen, as I said, a lot of people who actually create their own hierarchy. So they, they're faced with a flat space, and they create a hierarchy of links, and then traditional style navigation. Um, a lot of this is actually about how good the search tools are within the wiki, and, and, and some are better than others. If you have really good wiki search, it makes it a lot easier to find um, what you want. But, but, but do you think that solves the problem of repetition of information? particular long topic may have repetition from yeah. other topics and you, you may get you know contradictions, especially in engineering documents. A lot of this is about uh, the culture and how well people engage with the wiki. So when people view a wiki as a publishing platform and they slap stuff up there and they never look at it again, then you get these, these issues around duplication, out of date material. And that's exactly the same as an intranet. So um, you get these kind of like dead intranets that have been around for years, and no one's actually bothered to um, look at the data and cull it. Um, and part of that is because just the overhead on actually finding the page and going to whoever looks after the intranet and saying, can you change this? And then by the time they've got around to changing it, what you wanted to change it to is actually changed again. Um, with the wiki, yes, you can end up with kind of like you know, dead pages, but it's far easier to go in and, and deprecate things and go, this is out of date. And one of the things that we did was take the idea from Wikipedia of having um, stubs and notices. So you could put a little stub page up and say, um, we need information on this. Um, and that acts as a kind of prompt to the people who have the information who perhaps previously didn't feel confident enough to put that information up there because maybe you know, they didn't think it was that important but it gives them the kind of cultural 
uh, impetus the, to, to do that. Um, in terms of you know, the mythical wiki gardener, um, you know, and this is the idea that some people publish stuff and some people go around tidying up afterwards, you know, go gardening. We actually did have these people who were obsessive, really obsessive, about making sure that everything was up to date. And you, the ratio of, of people putting stuff up and people being obsessive about it can be, you don't need very many gardeners to have a healthy wiki. But it's encouraging people. I mean, again, you know, one of the hurdles that we had was um, people would just kind of go, oh, that's not my page, so I can't edit it. And it's like, well, the whole point of a wiki is that you can edit any page. It's collectively owned. This isn't about you having um, responsibility for this section but being unallowed to touch this, that section. And that was a cultural issue. And most of these things, it's not really about the technology. It's not about, yeah, a WYSIWYG editor helps massively, but it's not really about that. It's how people react to the environment um, and the comparison between the sort of social environment and the hierarchical permission-based environment that people are used to. So. Thanks, maybe if you have tools, recommendations as well of wiki preferences, that's interesting as well. Um, I think the, the wiki side's quite odd in a way when you compare wiki tools and, and blogging tools. So the blogging tools are generally much more well-developed. Um, even though they haven't been around so as long. I mean, Wiki's been around over 10 years, and they're kind of, it's only recently, in the last two to three years, that they've actually started becoming appropriate for business use. Um, in terms of you know, tool recommendations, it very much depends on who, who you're, who's going to use it. So um, things like Media Wiki is a really nicely developed, it's open source, really lovely. You put that in front of a business user, and they just run screaming from the room, because it's like, there's all this like weird wiki markup stuff. It's, it's complicated. It doesn't look like Word. Um, so then if you give them something like um, social text or uh, there's a new one called Thought Farmer, which is like a structured wiki, and these are much, much more familiar paradigms. It's very much like WYSIWYG editor. I click on the bold and it looks bold. I don't have to deal with this whole, is it as an asterisk or you know, whether it's a, uh, links are done with brackets or several brackets or negotiating different types of wiki markup. Because people like, they have a comfort zone and that comfort zone is generally MS Office. And this is what they know, this is the paradigm they're used to. And the tools that replicate that most closely are the ones they feel most comfortable with. Um, but of course, you know, when you're dealing with the techies, you know, the IT department, they'll do whatever they like. So we used to have this big row about transclusion because um, we were using social text in, in, in DRKW and there was uh, a whole bunch of people who wanted to use MediaWiki instead. And like, it, social text doesn't do transclusion. I can't have this template thing here and then use it on all these other pages. And it was like, you know, you know edge case, majority of people probably not going to do that. Um, so, yeah, and, and within blogs as well, there's like different levels of, um, you know, it depends on how, how you want to run your blogs. So I did some work with, uh, did a case study of a pharmaceutical company in Europe who was using blogs for um, uh, competitive intelligence. And they had six blogs, and they were all Chinese walls between all of them. Um, but certain people had sort of multiple blog privileges. So if they had one item, they would have to post it on multiple blogs where it was relevant. And they were using um, Traction Team Page, which allowed them to have basically, I mean, it was a blog version of Transclusion. They had one entry, and they labeled it with the different blog names, and it showed up in four different places. Um, other people you know, use uh, WordPress because it's free, and it's quite nice. Um, and it, it all very much depends on you know, what level of granularity do you need. Do you need LDAP um, sign-on? Do you need what kind of integration do you need? Can this actually just stand alone on its own little server with your own little login? Is it that important that you have integration? Because you know, a lot of the tools just don't play well with enterprise-level systems. So it's really about figuring out you know, from that point of view, you know, who are your users? What are they going to find comforting? Um, and how does this fit in with your IT infrastructure that exists? Um, and yeah, I've, I've had one company point blank refuse to uh, install a Linux server because they did everything on, on .NET. It was like, nope, this is it. We're not having Linux over our dead bodies. And it was like, hmm, okay, you know, that's, that narrows down your options, but that's your decision. 
So, you know, IT in that point, that company were less than flexible, but they made their decision. So, you know, it fits, they want everything to fit together, and I can understand that. So. I It's about your constituency. Who, yeah, if people feel happy with a semi-broken, ugly wiki, then give them what they're happy with. Um, I think that there is a, or well, there does seem to be a separation between the more technically minded people who are happy with that kind of a scenario and business focused people, people who are basically used to Word and they really like stuff to look kind of shiny. So um, when you have a, you, you present to them a, a you know, the tiddly wiki or, or, or something like that, and they just look ah and run away. Um, you present them something that looks a bit like the corporate intranet, the same branding and you know, logos and stuff. Then they immediately just kind of you're lowering a sort of cognitive barrier for them. You know, you're kind of taking away something that makes it seem other and making it seem same, and they're comfortable with same. So if you're in an environment where people are used to uh, very bare, ugly tools and, and that, then that's for them is same. Um, so yeah, I think it entirely depends on who you're dealing with. So what are the main things that suck in social software? Like if you were speaking to an audience of a lot of bright engineers who might be able to get together and fix things, then what would be kind of <laughs> the main things you would want? Um, with wikis, they need to... Um, deal with contention better. Um, that's one of the biggest pains in the neck is when you do a nice big edit and some other bug has come along and changed a full stop and you lose your edit. Um, granularity in terms of being able, particularly in enterprises is important, being able to actually parcel off areas of, of wiki without actually having to do multiple installations. And you know, stuff like social text does that fine, but a lot of the wikis don't. Um, one thing I would just love to see would be sub ether edit style simultaneous editing, so that you could actually see in real time the other person typing. And that way, I mean, I think sub ether edit is a tool that um, actually Steph and I have used at conferences to take conference notes. And it's fabulous when you've got everyone on the same network and you've got you know, three or four people in sub ether edit and we're all kind of like taking notes and someone's coming along behind and adding in URLs and correcting typos. And at the end of the talk, you've got this fabulous near perfect transcript of what was said with additional points and, and URLs and the whole thing. And when that works, it works fabulously. Um, one of the issues with um, wikis, even the ones that show you when, I mean, you know, with Google Documents, it kind of vaguely has this whole kind of when you hit refresh or save, it kind of shows you the other person's edit, but you can't see what they're doing at the time that they're doing it. So if you are editing together, you still end up with the same contention-like issues of, you know, well, I just deleted this bit and you just edited it, so I've just deleted the thing that you edited and blah. Um, better versioning. So uh, edit histories are too clunky. Um, if you have uh, an edit history, I want to be able to say this, this whole user session of this person making these edits, and these are exactly the words that they added and took out, and a better display. At the moment, a lot of it is just kind of like, per paragraph, this paragraph changed. Well, that doesn't help me skim through the paragraph and see what was changed. Um, and multiple 
uh, comparisons so that I can say I want you know, version 12, version 24, and version 60 side by side and see between all of them which ones changed and who did what so you could actually um, tag the changes with the person that changed them rather than tag or as well as have the, um, the version tagged with the person who changed it. So you could actually look at multiple differences. Um, I think wikis need the most development. Um, blogs, when you look at stuff like WordPress, they is really nicely thought through. Um, and I'm looking forward to playing with uh, Movable Type 4, which I actually haven't yet, because it sounds like they've addressed a lot of the issues. But within the enterprise, again, granularity and, and permissions are really, really important. Being able to say, this group of people has access, and this group of people doesn't. Um, and I think uh, you know, scalability is also huge. Wiki, both wikis and blogs have issues with scaling. Um, once a wiki gets past a certain size, it can start to get incredibly hard to find stuff. Yeah. You know, wiki search mainly sucks. Um, and you know, wiki search from outside of the tool, I, I don't even know if that actually even works. I mean, at most wikis that have search, it's all internal. So you're stuck with, if that wiki sucks, it sucks. Um, blog search varies from, yeah, oddly enough. But, but figuring out, because basically with wikis, it is a, it's a flat, um, flat data. It's just all big pot. It's all big mush. And people automatically add in a hierarchy, because that's what they feel comfortable with. Because the search doesn't provide them with, uh, they don't think Google when they th see wiki search. So you know, when people get to come to you know, Google search and, and they know how it all works and there's a paradigm they understand, but they don't map that paradigm across to something like a wiki or a blog. It's not an instinctive thing. So moving people from hierarchy to search is really, really difficult because they just, they have this mental block. Because I don't think they really, I don't know. Do people see Google search as search, or is it just location, finding things? Which it sounds slightly stupid thing to say, but um, when people want to find stuff in a wiki, they just click through links. Even if it's a half dozen links, they'll just kind of go click, 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 because they expect hierarchy. So um, yeah, better ways to move people from the hierarchy to search. Um, what else? That's just off the top of my head. I'm sure I could come up with a lot more if I thought about it harder. <laughs> so, I'm being a little self-checked on the side of things. Um, do you have more use cases on the internal, and internal uses of blogging as opposed to using the Mark Bacon, which is also understood? Yeah. And it seems like it's, it's harder to get traction internally with the blogs. And so one of the weird things about blogs is that um, Blogs suffer from the social part of social software. That um, people firstly think that blogs are diaries. Um, and it's only recently in the British media that they have stopped banging on about blogs as diaries. Because as soon as you get into this you know, personal expression stuff, people in business immediately kind of like go, oh, this is scary. I actually don't want to have a diary in my business. Uh, and I don't want other people doing it either. So um, the interesting use cases of blogs, some of them are, again, very mundane. So um, uh, Disney uh, used blogs for event logging in their broadcast department. And basically, they took out uh, a custom-built database app that really was a bit rubbish, and they replaced it with movable type. And every time something happened, it was blogged. And you had you know, search, which they didn't have before. Um, you had archives, which they didn't have before. You had ability to comment, which they didn't have before. So they actually, went, even though it, their previous database was custom built, it sounds like it was a bit rubbish. Um, and, and that was kind of like, you know, the adoption issue for that was just non-existent, because they basically went, throw that away, bring this in. This is all part of your job. Just get on with it. Um, Quite a few people I know have used blogs for kind of personal knowledge management, if you like. So keeping track of, you know, calling vendors, talking to clients, um, just general information that's important um, so that they can find stuff more easily. Um, one guy I know um, actually 
he, used, he was working on a project where he had to report every month, but he didn't really have any colleagues. Um, so every month he would have to go through all of his email and write this report for his boss and say, this is what I've been doing. Um, when he started blogging, he just stopped doing that. And if his boss said, how are you doing? He just said, read the blog. Everything's on the blog. The whole thing is catalogued. So it, that kind of became a reporting tool for him, a sort of tracking and reporting tool. Um, competitive intelligence one, we see lots of kind of knowledge sharing around that sort of area of kind of like, yeah, how's the market developing? What ideas have we got? What's happening out there? Uh, what's happening in here? Um, and just random kind of, that some companies actually do allow kind of random social blogs where people just kind of like go, oh, this is interesting. And you know, this might be something on YouTube or whatever. Um, and interestingly, that seems really counterintuitive to let people blog about social things and, and non-work related things internally. But it turns out to be a very good way for people to get to know each other. And in very large organizations, you end up with lots of small communities based around you know, your colleagues and the cool people that they know. You might be working on something that someone else is working on, but you may never actually find out about it. And what blogs have, I've seen um, do is actually bring people together, because people have started kind of going, oh, I, I saw this article about such and such, and yeah, I'm doing this. And they'd start to talk and then figure out they're working on similar sorts of things. Um, in, in one case, you know, one guy in London, one guy in Tokyo, they would never, ever meet. Turned out they were doing basically the same thing. And then that opens the door to collaboration and, and smarter working. So there is actually value to having that kind of social stuff. Of, yeah, you know, um, one guy at DRKW didn't know his boss, had never met his boss um, for like six months after he started. And they were talking on the wiki and on, on the blogs. And then when they did meet, they just kind of like hit the ground running. There was none of this awkward sort of like, oh, I'm your boss. Oh, huh. It was all... They already knew each other, and they already knew what was happening and, and, and all the rest of it. So these, I think you know, we underestimate the importance of social relationships in business. Businesses are made of people. People have social relationships. Without those, it's very difficult to function properly. So um, you know, allowing small talk is beneficial. Allowing these social relationships to, to form and to be strengthened is also important. Anyone? Anything else? I think we're actually done anyways. 12. So, wow. Thank you very much.